Hello everyone, today we talk about the intellectual movements of the Severian Age. Um, so this phase in Roman history that remains a bit suspended between the glory of the Antonines and the crisis of the 3rd century, many say that the, the seeds of the crisis were already present in, into this phase. Definitely the Empire had its own dynastic appeals and, and tensions, however it was still a sound system that you know was functioning substantially and uh, at this point was embracing fully Hellenistic culture, right? In fact, in, in its entirety, this intellectual f ferment of the time is brought from, from the East and from the court of the Syrian princesses as a true laboratory of ideas and therefore in every field the authors are Hellenic in, in language. We can start with this first one, important historian, uh, Cassius Dio, right? Cassius Dio Cochellanus in Latin, or uh, in, in Greek Dion uh, Cassius or uh, Co uh, Cheyanus. Um He was uh, ele essentially an Hellenic historian of Rome. He was born in Nicaea, uh, in Bithynia, before 163 AD and died uh, after 229 AD. He was senator and consul and author of this great Roman history that, however, only partially uh, survives and um, he's not considered a particularly deep historian like, you know, previous uh, Roman historiographers had been, but however still a conscientious, uh, conscientious uh, author that sometimes still, yeah, b believes, but it, it was fairly normal at the time actually to believe in things like magics and dreams, uh, so not being uh, you know, always so objective. Uh, he had as its own his own model Thucydides. He introduces this discourses uh, into um, into the story, and only in part these are based on real events. And his style somewhat researched, although by some it's considered relatively uh, you know devoid of 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 true of true color of of ta of of, um, of great. Um, let's say, individual originality, but still these are kind of literary uh, criticisms that you know can also take into consideration uh, general standards and maybe at the time weren't even so so important and there is naturally a reason if there is a, an evolution uh, in this sense. He was of the f came from this uh, noble Bithynian family to which um, Dio uh, Chrysostomus uh, belonged, but it was the first one who brought the cognomen of Cochellanus. Um, Cassius Dio was son of Cassius Apronianus that had been this high functionary of the empire. Uh, Cassius was educated in Rome where he um, uh, soon became senator. Uh, he became friend with Pertinax and eventually with Septimius Severus and he reached uh, shortly the highest honors. He was Praetor in 194, eventually consul, proconsul of Africa and governor of Dalmatian and of Pannonia Superior. And eventually in 229, he was ordinary consul together with the Emperor Alexander Severus, right? E though he uh, didn't finish uh, in Rome the year of consulship because he uh, retired, came back to, to Bithynia. His works, as we've said, is this Roman history, the Historia Romana, or in Greek, uh, uh, Romaica Historia, uh, in 80 books, uh, subdivided into decades, from the come of Aeneas in Italy up to 229 AD, the year of his own uh, second consulship. And we have only uh, 25 books from, from the work, uh, of the origi from the originals, uh, the the one uh, the, the ones that go from the 36th to the 60th that is essentially in the story between 69 uh, BC to 47 D, uh, AD uh, part of the books 78th and 79th so the years 216 219 AD uh, that have been extracted uh, in uh, Byzantine uh, florilege right. Uh, he he was also author of a compendium of um, uh, John Xiphilinus in the 11th century and of the one of John Sonaris in, in the 12th. Mm -hmm. So uh, the work that is um, preceded by an opusculum on the um, 
marvels that happened at the beginning of the Emperor Septimius Severus and by a short story of the events after the death of Commodus that were ruled between 193 and 197 uh, Cassius Dio waited for 10 years from 198 for collecting all the materials and uh, and eventually 12 years for the writing uh, we're talking obviously about the story um, so he eventually took the story once again uh, in, in the last years of his life in Bithynia where uh, he actually completed it so it, it was only at the end uh, uh, divided in, in 80 books following the uh, analytic order we don't know much about the sources that Cassius Dio used for Roman history in general surely he used Livy and, and Tacitus and by um, and, and from the 180 that is the year of that of Marcus Aurelius he followed uh, however as he uh, himself warned about uh, uh, the, uh, the personal records fundamentally uh, of these events other very important uh, figure, another historian, he's Herodian. Herodian, other historian, Herodianos in, in Greek, Herodianos in Latin. Uh, he he was also, in fact, uh, a Hellenic writer of the third uh, century uh, uh, A.D., and he is uh, meant to to have been originary of Syria, um, although uh, some some can even say that that he came from Antioch, but um, it's it's still somewhat debatable. Meaning that here we're talking about uh, Greek authors. We're we're not literally talking about you know people who came from a you know the the word Greek uh, as a native tongue. You know that the Greek at this point is the the most uh, widespread uh, language in in the basin of the Mediterranean. So basically anybody who it, it's basically would be like English today, right? Everybody would would use it as a literary language together with Latin that however was minority o overall in the empire surely more used uh, in the in the west but in this eastern provinces it's really Greek that comes uh, as the coin right and um, th there have been problems also in identifying the person uh, some uh, thought to see him in Tiberius Claudius uh, Herodianus he was um, uh, legate for the province of Sicily but um, this historian has he he says himself um, although not not having really uh, uh, you know assumed public um, titles he he never became a senator right so in 192 uh, and in 204 AD he found himself in Rome where he uh, assisted to the spectacles who were celebrated in those years by uh, Commodus and Severus respectively and um, and he was probably born uh, not much later 170 AD so Herodian's work um, makes up a little volume called the history of the Empire from the death of Marcus Aurelius. So it goes from 180 to 238 AD. It's divided in eight books that are uh, distributed in this way. The first one is about Commodus, uh, the, the second one is about Pertinax and, and Julian, the third is about Septimius Severus, the fourth is about Caracalla, the fifth is about Macrinus and Eliogabalus, the sixth about Alexander, the seventh about Maximine and and the uh, Gordians, the eight about Maxim and uh, Balbinus. So as um, the um, we uh, we we understand from the, f the beginning of his work in his uh, introduction, fundamentally Herodian was writing with the intent to compose a work that could correspond to the literary rules that. Uh, ruled uh, at this point for, for quite a time so he, he had started in order to follow the great models and he find phrases and motives that were you know basically used at, at that point by kind of a standard fashion but his narrative manages uh, all 
you know, all of the time not to sound particularly bright. Uh, you know, it's been defined as soulless in in a way. And relatively to content, uh, Herodian declares to collect the uh, facts occurred under the eyes of the man of his time, and therefore that were soundly witnessed, right? And uh, he boasts the uh, scruples of his historian that um, se on several occasions he says, I, I wrote um, what I saw and I heard in the course of my life, of which sometimes was part of, and he uh, calculates in the um, it's that the story mm, has to span for, for a period of s 60 years um, and all of this is it's already in his first book it, which mm, demonstrates because there is no reason to believe that, that someone inserted other material eventually that Herodian was starting his work already uh, out, I mean very li late uh, already after 238 so at the end of the history so when he was also pretty old, right? He he was around seventy. So, the main problem with Herodian's work is that uh, it, it's the strictly historical part. I, in order to understand on which base it was actually written, uh, first of all, it's rather obscure uh, that whether his work, uh, uh, maybe except for the last two books, was was written on actual written sources or rather on oral ones like he w wanted instead to, to make us believe but um, in terms of historical uh, source uh, the written sources that mm, you know that are th we know that he he made a, a wide use of them at least and that some some pop out it, it's evident uh, others are just uh, you know loosely traceable but of course he used other you know sound base of other uh, other sources that for which he didn't quite just uh, investigate on other on other people so there is this following of, of uh, the model right uh, that uh, it becomes at one point uh, I, uh, also this idea of you know um, talking about what he had seen or heard from from other people is kind of a rhetorical expedient and uh, and um, d d he imitated seemingly uh, Dio, right? You know there are many points in common between Cassius Dio and Herodian, and um, at the same time that they also disagree on something, right? So the explanation of the relation between the two historians is uh, somewhat uh, still to 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 be assessed. Um, I don't know about later historiographical researches on this but um, it's it, it's likely at least that these two authors used common sources and um, and uh, and yet that uh, Herodian had um, used especially uh, next to Dio uh, in Greek also some Latin historical source wh which is interesting because as we've seen that was not particularly dominant at the time and um, in uh, at least in terms of the most uh, recent sources, so I think that uh, I don't want to say something because I don't know much about this stuff. But um, it's it, it was at least trying to find uh, something relatively different. So these two orders um, um, are um, th also th they all had some of important responsibilities. In, in some ways, they they all had uh, this privileged relation with the Severian epoch, and um, and they they're both uh, they have they both shared this uh, idea of having served the emperors before coming back towards the end of their life in, in to their uh, homeland to eventually write uh, their, their their own experiences in the world. Looking at very other important figures of this, uh, intellectual figures of the time, definitely there is the field of law, right? At this point, um, very important juridical systems are built that will be um, uh, fundamental essentially uh, up to uh, Theodosian and, and Justinian's times. Um, we're talking about um, at the school of Beirut, for example, in Lebanon, that would remain basically until the time of Justinian the most important 
uh, uh, juridical center of the empire, and this scene dominates com uh, is dominated completely by uh, Papinianus. Right, Papinianus was uh, it's this great name in Roman law. He was a pupil, according to a dubious tradition of Scaevola, and um, he um, this uh, had this this great fame right that would be maintained for for a very long as the prince of jurists at the time he probably came from um from syria as well from emesa probably and under marcus aurelius he had been assessor uh, of the prefectus praetorio right and um under um Septimius Severus, he had been Magister Libellorum, right? So he had covered certain charges that had were, you know, very close to very important admi administrative functions of the empire. And um, uh, from 203 up to the death of Septimius Severus, he had been become Prefectus Praetorio himself, right? So and eventually, you know, he had pretty uh, sad uh, and as he was killed by order of Caracalla in the year 212, in the in the massacre of the followers of of Geta, right? So, uh, important person that evidently had some political, you know, he he, he definitely a role uh, as well. And uh, it's probably a legend the new that uh, wants him to 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 die essentially uh, to be killed for for having refused to justify legally the fratricide receipt of Caracalla, right? So, uh, it's kind of, you know, it fits in the scene, but it may be not really gone like this. So, um, it's this tradition might, as, might have been developed essentially because of the moral intonation that his writings uh, display, um, at least, uh, at the also that also produced his celebrity in some way and um, he, he is considered certainly um, by certain standards the great uh, the last of the great jurists for the strength of analysis uh, of the principles and for the assessment of the practical necessities in life right uh, he has still this so in a society that is still fluid that it has a relatively it's not yet fr to be framed like in the Perpetua Sanctio, like in the Theodosian Code, and eventually the Justinian one. Um, he is is kind of a independent and serene criticism, and um, it, it it doesn't have by uh, creative and spontaneous power of conception to be uh, compared, for example, to the jurists of the age of, of Augustus and Hadrian though. Um, his principal works are these 37 books of questiones that were written under Septimius Severus and uh, then other 19 books of responsa that were uh, finished only uh, under uh, Caracalla and two books of definiciones and other special works in uh, legal uh, uh, in municipal and uh, adultery law, um, and on the genuinity of such wor of special works that were written in Greek, and that um, we 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 kind of doubt uh, by certain standard. Um, and Papinianus is one of the five jurists that are that would be. Uh, indicated in the constitution of Theodosius the second and Valentinian the third uh, and to those doctrines had to attain the judges in the decision of controversies settlement of, of controversies and, and instead at the parity of votes um, it it had to prevail the doctrine presented by Papinian while in the ca in ca contrary case uh, it was the majority to decide at that point. So he was such an authoritative figure after uh, two century that um, still um, the, um, uh, the 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 idea was that you know if if there was a you know the majority 
of, of jurists uh, deciding in favor of something, you know, uh, that was low. But if there was a parity, right, uh, at that point it was just uh, Papinian, Papinianus' tradition that really settled the matter once for all. Um, then, um, in post-classical schools, uh, his authority was very big, and his response uh, were matters of, of study in uh, in the usually in the third and fourth year of legal studies. Uh, he was called by the emperor of the third century a uh, vir consultissimus or uh, prudentissimus, so a person who definitely knew a lot, that had studied a lot and that had this um, wisdom that was at the base of, of the same of the same law and, um, and uh, even at the time of Justinian he was defined as acutissimi ingeni et merito ante alios excellence so this means of, a he of this uh, most acute um, uh, ingenuity and merit in front of all uh, excelling in front of all the others right so uh, a very uh, famous figure that would be remembered in fact in the history of law and that belonged uh, to this uh, to this context and um, the uh, uh, at the same time it, it's important to remember that uh, in this period the uh, the the imperial opinion in matters of law is increasing, right? So, uh, this is a moment in which the Roman jurisprudence fundamentally is about to it has its last moment of kind of uh, of of uh, spontaneity by by certain standards. Um, so, the importance of imperial intervention increases. Uh, looking at more philosophical works that were what made effectively up great part of the ancient uh, literary and, and even scientific production because actually you know what we call science in the ancient world was largely like philological right it wasn't actual what we call like scientific today so um, also in this field the contribution of the East is very very important because um, the there is a great change, kind of an emotional change in the Roman Empire because the um, the traditional philosophies start giving less certainties than before. You know, we have seen that this world is fundamentally same functioning. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's um, progressively also uh, transforming. Um, there is a progressive social stratification, uh, a greater number of um, of of masses of uh, of uh, of disinherited basically and of uh, impoverished uh, individuals that need and feel like like a mass this more kind of less individualistic and more um, let's say um, collective needs of feeling of security uh, etc. And for one side, there is a double reaction, right? Uh, uh, for one side, there is um, d a new demand for the ancient models, you know, for the precepts and models that um, had existed in the past. From the other side, there is a, a different uh, orientation that, in fact, as we will see, will mark the, the most uh, important thinkers um, o of the time. There is also this exoteric need of, you know, of, of mm, that that really fascinate um, the the Roman subjects that uh, you know because uh, uh, they're as fascinating as passionating as long as they're hidden and revealed to the only initiated. So these exoteric cults start to spread increasingly. You know that the East also had a proper um, you know the, most of these cults were known in in ancient Rome since centuries and and, and centuries at this point. But the Eastern influence at this point is, is it's felt stronger because most of Eastern philosophies were deeply imbued with, with this sense. And it's a bit of a shift from the individualistic mentality of the of the end of you know of the Roman of the origins, you know, that had married, for example, Stoicism. You know, Stoicism, the Stoa had found certain points in common with the 
the, the morality of, of the ancient Roman because he was stressing this idea of, of you know having a burden and taking responsibility for it and accepting what was going on um, without uh, complaining so but from the other side there is also this less uh, in fact individually based idea for which you have to pass through a uh, along through a uh, a, a series of of an initiation fundamentally that made you participating to to a greater um, divinity or its uh, uh, emanations and it's th the way uh, in a way you could be absorbed almost by it and enjoying its its, its benefits so this naturally is we made some videos about um, this topics about exoteric cults uh, we made I don't actually remember what we talked about. But uh, I think what about the gnosis actually in general, not mm, anything specific. But um, it um, you you can look at that. In uh, I don't remember which it would be ancient history or I don't remember honestly uh, which playlist was it. However, we can start with some of these authors. The first one is Philostratus from Athens, um, which actually is. Um, a name that is given to two sophists of the second and the third century uh, AD, uh, and both came from this famous family of uh, Lemnos, and they're often confused. Actually, the, the first one is Flavius Philostratus, that was born around 170 AD and died between 244-249 AD, and he was called the Athenian because he taught in Athens and eventually he was at Rome uh, as a follower of the Empress Julia Domna right? and um, he, by Rome he was uh, pushed to you know, write a, a life of Apollonius of Tiana that was expression of the um, uh, of the mystical Neopythagorism and it was this kind of long apologetical uh, no, uh, romance that uh, in, in eight books on the life of this famous Thaumaturge and the life is contraposed by uh, Eurocles to, to the Gospels and it was eventually confuted by Eusebius who uh, event would give a, um, a life to a long polemic that um, that went on for, for a very long time. So Philostratus wrote eventually the life of the Sophists in two books. They're kind of superficial but useful biographies in order to to, to know the history of the second sophistry. And um, it, it seems to be um, uh, attributable to philosophers, uh, Philostratus, also a treaty on gymnastics and uh, of the 73 letters attributed to him, the first uh, 64 that are erotic but in scholastic form are rather dubious and the other three that are safer uh, are you know attributed to him um, and the last one is about uh, a defense, uh, an apology of the sophists, right? Then there is this other figure that is philosopher, always Philostratus of Lemnus that was son of Nervianus that was in turn uh, a nephew uh, of the uh, of the first Philostratus. He was born around 191. Um, he, he was in Rome, he taught in Athens as well and he died in Lemnus and he wrote the heroic that uh, some in fact uh, attribute to, to the first Philostratus and this is a dialogue of a traveler in a in a vineyard uh, uh, keeper essentially that uh, evokes the uh, appearance of certain Homeric heroes, and then um, another work uh, in two uh, books that um, describe uh, of uh, sixty four uh, pictures of mystical of mythical object in a uh, villa in, in Naples and it's interesting for the history of art and mythology and that's mostly the reason why we remember that and um, the, the uh, we, we have um, uh, this uh, interest, interest towards Neo-Pythagorism that would evolve uh, 
as we will see, also Neoplatonism by by certain standards. And um, and Philostratus had a great uh, fame because of this work because um, the 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 work on the especially uh, the the first Philostratus the life of Apollonius of, of Theana was a, a great success. You know, even though it was full of anachronisms, etc., uh, the marvelous and irrational that this biography revealed uh, was very catchy for the spirit of, of the time. Right? Um, then there are bit roughly flatter but still interesting works by Diogenes Laertius there was this other Hellenic uh, writer about which we know only the name uh, maybe also the origin because uh, uh, Laertius would come from this um, locality in Cilicia uh, but uh, we were not really sure about this and he we also don't know much about his life after all he uh, lived towards the, the mid third century and we know about him uh, a collection of lives of the most famous philosophers, uh, the, the title which is kind of uncertain. His work is composed by a premise uh, in which it's, may, it's told the story of the origin of philosophy uh, among the, the most ancient peoples and, and ten books of biographies uh, from the, uh, an the, the ancient wise and uh, to Epicurus. And the work, together with some other um, um, that that say that contains actually some anecdotes and other news that are often disordered and incongruent is, however, mm, of of great uh, use for the quantity of material that it, it it renders available. So the value of the of the information is you know still to be assessed with with uh, you know step by step depending uh, looking at uh, trying to understand f from which sources this is th th this is taken um, however it, it's certain that uh, the work of Diogenes Laertius unifies this secular work of doxographers of biographers and authors of successions right so it by taking back previous classifications Diogenes Laertius distinguishes two great philosophical currents, the Ionian one and the, the Italic one, and um, the Ionian one starts from Anaximandrus, uh, Anaximandrus sorry, and uh, uh, Thaletis, uh, a, that is included uh, among uh, actually the, the first, the, the seven uh, sages, and uh, he arrived through Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, and Archelaus, uh, Archelaus to Socrates, and here the uh, the things place in three branches. The first one starts from Plato, and goes through uh, all the history of the Academy, and uh, reaches Clitomachus. The second starts from Antisthenes and, and through Cynism and Stoicism, arrives to Chrysippus, and the third one, starting from Plato, through Aristotle, arrives to Theophrastus. Right. The Italic branch uh, is is instead um, from the side of uh, Pythagoras, and through the Eleatis, the Atomists, and the Skeptics, uh, reaches up to Epicurus, right? To whom is dedicated the tenth book, and of which Diogenes Laertius has also um, preserved three famous uh, letters, and. Um, so, uh, another important figure is uh, Athenaeus of Naucratis, another uh, le uh, Hellenic learned man who lived between the 2nd and the 3rd century AD, who is author of a work that is titled the uh, De Pnosophistai in, in, in Greek, which would mean basically uh, the banqueting sophists, right? which is in 15 books and it was perhaps a reduction of a previous um, edition in, in 30 uh, books and uh, 
This is set in a banquet that is given by a, a rich Roman pontiff, Publius Livius Laurentius, um, with uh, numerous uh, Greek uh, learned men, including uh, grammarians, doctors, uh, lawyers, philosophers that basically uh, chat about most different topics but more of erudition than good taste so that the uh, the work um, has preserved to us some part of uh, fragments of attic of, of middle attic comedy and also of new attic comedy um, copious rests of uh, er relics of um, Hellenic historiography uh, of uh, Hellenistic erudition as well and of rarities of every kind and it's important also not to, disting uh, to, to distinguish this uh, author from uh, the, his homonymous who had lived in the second century BC uh, that instead had written rhetorical works that would uh, eventually be used by Quintilianus uh, about whom uh, uh, from which we you know, we, we have only a few fragments um, surviving. Then, another author, important, Alexander of Aphrodisia in, in Caria. He, um, he f we find him under Septimius Severus between 198 and 211 uh, in, uh, in Athens um, to uh, teaching philo uh, Aristotelic philosophy, right? He had studied Aristotle with the peripatetic Hermenius, uh, uh, Aristocles, and uh, so Sigenus, uh, and uh, very important among his original works are uh, the one on fate, the one on the blending, and um, both are directed against the Stoics and naturally in favor of the Aristotelian doctrine. And in the second of these works, Alexander fought against the uh, stoic intuition of the penetration of the bodies uh, within each other, especially for what concerns the divinity, the uh, eternal fire that penetrates and uh, r r gives life to the entire world. Um, uh, differently from the, the, in the ar Aristotelic intellect that is separated from from this uh, and immobile, right? So, in um, in the first uh, of these works, also he reasserts the uh, freedom of will that is taught by Aristotle against the necessity of the Stoics, that stress instead kind of more deterministic uh, ideas, and um, that that or, or at least you know the the concept that. The Stoic has to accept basically everything without much of a uh, of uh, an active um, uh, demand, you know, attempt to, to change what what is going on. And also in the strictly ethical field, um, um, uh, after all, the the Stoics uh, claimed a certain freedom of action. So after all, this criticism is not so maybe not so sound. However. Uh, uh, Alexander is especially uh, an exegete uh, of Ar Aristotle, right? He pro excellence uh, of his uh, true commentaries if, uh, are preserved only the first one of the Analytica Priora, um, the Topica, and the Meteorologia, uh, the De Sensu, and um, the books one to five of the Metaphysica, right? So the interpretation given to him by the, intel the, the Aristotelic intellect has ensured him a considerable place in the history of philosophy and also given origin to the uh, school of the Alexandrists, right? And uh, in Aristotle it remains the strange the, uh, the relation that uh, the active intellect have um, with its own, uh, um, the individual existence as well as with the divinity, right? And Alexander interprets um, the passive intellect instead as a simple disposition that is joined with the, s the animal soul. There is a 
um, material intellect and a physical intellect that um, pass from uh, matter uh, from from power that is matter to act that is basically becoming acquired intellect or mm, intellect acquired by disposition by work of the active intellect and the the latter is outside of us it's identified with the divinity right so our individual intellect therefore dies with our own uh, body so this is the main the main concept then um, other important figure Sextus Empiricus so Sextus was a thinker and uh, and, and doctor also of Hellenic language he lived uh, between the second uh, century at the, the end of the second century at the beginning of the third seemingly he was African by birth and of his uh, works we have the 11 books collected under the title uh, against the mathematicians basically but this complexive title comprehends two different works the first one is the um, the uh, the against the mathematicians but where the mathematicians are the professors that teach doctrines uh, the base of education uh, that is grammar and rhetorics and other disciplines that um, would be what would be later known as quadrivium and that from the time of from since the time of Plato were presented like a organic complex that, that are as you know geometry arithmetics astronomy and um, uh, by sexus uh, however it's rather seen more like as astrology and music the second one is uh, this work in five books that have were written before uh, is set with the title uh, against the dogmatics there is against the philosophers uh, the logicians the f uh, physicists uh, and the ethicists and uh, who are the dogmatic uh, according to sexist because they presume that they can affirm true doctrines right uh, and then there are other um, uh, the uh, this other work the uh, lines of Pyrrhonism that uh, make up a short but complex compendium of Pyrrhonian philosophy and uh, it, it's somewhat difficult to determine the contribution that uh, Sextus brought to skeptical uh, thought and um, of whom he is by the way also th the most important historical s source right so the interests of Sextus consists in fact exactly in presenting the critical summa of, of skepticism against other various forms of dogmatism including in, in, in this one every pretend to to come into certain statements that are, are universally and uh, absolutely valid right so the uh, the, the, the response of criticism towards these attitudes is the suspension of judgment and, and Sextus uh, therefore um, explains you know in a, in a synthesis the criticism of the ways and of the means of demonstration adopted by the various um, dogmatic philosophical schools and these are three uh, the fr from which that is the man through which uh, there are the instruments of knowledge and sense of intellect and according to which that is the impression of fantasy so in this within this uh, critical examination of uh, means or, or, or ways of knowledge um, it's expressed also the criticism towards the technical and syllogistic demonstrative um, excuse me this uh, syllogistic and demonstrative techniques uh, for example the universal uh, of the syllogism that comprehends already the conclusion that presupposes it but also of the classical um, uh, the categorical classifications etc and uh, also about uh, certain concepts that make use of, of, of the various sciences the 
you know, stasis, demotion, the casual relation, etc. In Sextus is also central the criticism of the um, uh, the so-called dialelon throne pos. Uh, that is, every uh, demonstration requires a criterion of truth um, that um, in turn calls for another one and so on so that a demonstration in order to be true would require and comprehend a, an infinite number of things which is, it, which is impossible and also relevant is the criticism of, to, of the various uh, theological uh, doctrines especially the, the the stoic ones, right? So there is uh, here start as we will see. There is a sound criticism to stoicism that starts uh, appearing uh, in this age. Um, then we talk about this other author that is uh, Ammonius Saccas, right? Um, that is the first great Neoplatonic that uh, founds, in fact towards 200 a AD, this philosophical school I in Alexandria that would eventually have as disciples Plotinus and Origenes that we will talk now, that are uh, th about now, that they are the greatest thinkers of the 3rd century and, uh, and, and among the greatest of the ancient uh, world. And here it's interesting because the, the way is open to a uh, to, to the um, okay, we'll, we'll see it later with, with those two, but let's talk about Ammonius Saccas. Um, and uh, it, it's really the true initiator of the uh, Neoplatonic initiator of ancient philosophy, right? He lived in Alexandria between 175 A AD and 242 AD, and he became uh, he came in contact with philosophy, as Porphyrus says. Um, uh, close to Eusebius, this is told from the Ecclesi uh, histor uh, ecclesiastical stories, six nineteen seven, and um, and as a, so he was a Christian basically. Who came back? To, he came back to paganism, right? To Hellenic paganism, and he he basically returned to Plato. Right? Remember that Christianity, since the beginning, has some very close ties with with Platonism when uh, at least it acquires an Hellenistic dimension, right? So there are also some heterodox uh, uh, currents that, that have to do exactly with, with this relation, as you know, and generally speaking, Christianity will be, uh, up to the high Middle Ages, fundamentally strongly influenced by, by Platonism. Just think about, I don't know, St. Augustine, all of these, um, you know, of, of this powerful, uh, at this point, Neoplatonic base that would mostly develop in fact, with, with these odors that will be seen now, that it already existed, was in the air, uh, especially in the East. Um, so, um, um, uh, as we know, eventually Neoplatonism came to the to its greatest width in in the system of the Aeneids of of Plotinus, that, as we've seen, was this genial uh, student uh, pupil, pupil of uh, Ammonius. Uh, Ammonius, uh, interestingly enough, didn't leave actually uh, works as far as I know. He 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 was a teacher fundamentally, so that's where he impressed and uh, spread this doctrines through. However, as in uh, as a Plato's uh, as a, as in Aristotle actually was a pupil of, of Plato as well as we know. Um, there is this strong. Uh, Platonic uh, legacy, right? That is expressed, especially in the doctrine of the Nose, that would be this great uh, mover of the world. So that also Plotinus he inherited uh, the same concept from from his uh, from from Ammonius. So it's uh, it seems undeniable that uh, belong to Ammonius, at least in in general. Uh, uh, line the theory of the, the one uh, of the right the 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 principle the supreme principle of the world that is superior to the 
the ideal cosmos and the conce the humanistic conception that would be a very important base of physics and metaphysics of Neoplatonism, for, from for which from the one, in fact, emanates the world of the ideas and then the soul and 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 then the matter as well. And um, there is uh, an author, Nemesis, that attributes to Ammonius the incorporeity of the soul, which is uh, in accordance with the uh, Plotinian psychological doctrine. And this statement by Eurocles, for which Ammonius, um, for Ammonius, the uh, Platonic Aristotelic and Aristocratic doctrine were substantially the one thing, right? And this is difficult to reconcile, and only through the idea that uh, the the conception of of Plotinus ideal world uh, transmitted by Ammonius is a reconstruction uh, for uh, um, in a way that uh, its new uh, form basically escapes from Aristotelic criticism. So, in Ammonius' youth. Um, you know, Ammonius had a tough life, initially speaking. He was very poor. He had to transport uh, bags and other uh, heavy loads. And uh, hence the the name Saccas, right? So, uh, and the same Eurocles, um, um calls him kind of a, um, uh, in a way, let's say, uh, as um, trained by God, right? Uh, when uh, his uh, supreme principle, the One, was identified with divinity and had come in a Plotinian form to become the um, substratum of Christian uh, uh, dogma, uh, dogmas, right? So there are these, um, let's say, half ways, let's say, uh, the different interpretations we can give about this initial founders. Uh, especially when they didn't objectively leave anything written so that uh, have been naturally we ha for which we have to rely largely on the thoughts of other of other thinkers so opening to this other two <coughs> excuse me the greatest thinkers of the 3rd century Plotinus himself right there's a lot to talk about him maybe we have already done it sometime but try to make this synthesis today so he was also in here Plotinus in Greek, uh, Plotinus in Latin. So he was a, a, a Greek-speaking philosopher, and uh, he um, was born in Lycopolis in Egypt around uh, in the first uh, years of the third century, and he died in Campania in Italy in 269, 270. And he's the greatest representative of ancient Neoplatonism. Plotinus is author of the Enneads, that is, the six groups of nine works, uh, texts, let's say better, each. They were actually collected by Perfirius. And Plotinus basically uh, starts from the later formulations of the latest, actually, formulation of the Platonic thought and develops this uh, idea of gradual descent um, from the divine to the mundane of the one uh, from the one to the multiple right so uh, the first the most important source for Plotinus biography is uh, the life that he wrote um, that he was written uh, about him uh, by his uh, student his pupil Porphyrius and uh, other uh, information is provided by Eunapius in his uh, life of the sophists and the uh, lexicon of Sweden. And at 28 years old he started philosophical studies and after some time he became a scholar of Ammonius Sacca, as we have seen before, that the tradition uh, considers as the initiator of classical Neoplatonism that surely had this decisive influence in the uh, speculational education of Plotinus. So in 242, with the uh, intention to uh, to to draw from uh, to draw knowledge uh, essentially from Persian philosophy, 
he took part of the uh, to the um, expedition mounted by uh, Emperor Gordian against Persia. But given that the uh, the expedition was a failure, he had to come back to Antioch in Syria. So at that point he went to Rome, where he in his forties uh, began his uh, teaching activity. He became famous not only among those who were more directly um, in, in contact with him, I mean his students, etc., but also with the people. Now this is interesting because he was talking to the crowds as well. The crowds were, were fascinated by these uh, you know, new uh, ideals of transcendency of the, their typical Neoplatonism that would in fact flow into Christianity at one point. So, so the, 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 the people saw in him a sort of um, superior example of serenity and wisdom and went to him in order to, to ask for advice and for the resolution of controversies even. So it's this idea that fundamentally there is a wisdom that goes beyond even what, uh, 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 let's say, the state can do. I mean, the, these figures that can settle matters without recurring to other uh, systems, but just this knowledge fundamentally that uh, they they were uh, they were uh, in possess of, and um, many uh, people while dying also entrusted to him the tutelage of his own children. Right, so he was a that considered that trustworthy by by a certain standards. So after twenty six years of teaching. Plotinus also retired, as he was uh, ill, from Rome into the villa of one of his pupils in Campania, and he had that, that's where he died. So looking at his work and thought, uh, the interest of his teaching uh, was um, the um, was trig uh, was was felt uh, even into high Roman society. Th this is interesting. And the same emperor, Gallienus, for example, uh, showed his favor to him. Also, the empress Salonina did. And uh, it was because of this imperial protection that Plotinus could conceive, uh, without, however, uh, being able to realize it, his project of a, an ideal state, according to which the last and more mature form um, uh, that uh, Plato had uh, thought about would would basically take uh, become real, right? So, um, on the model of the laws, he had uh, it. Uh, this society had to be founded or uh, brought uh, back to life in the uh, constitutional organization of a city that would have had to be called Platonopolis. Uh, in honor of Plato, of course, and that would have um, uh, that would have hosted basically uh, Plotinus together with his followers. So, Plotinus' work is uh, constituted, as we have said, by the Aeneids, that is, these six groups of nine texts for each, eventually collected by Perfirius, and Pl Plotinian's Neoplatonism, that uh, takes uh, from Platonic thought, especially the later formulations, develops the idea of the gradual descent of the divine, from, from divine, divine to the mundane, as we said before, from the one to the multiple, and such descent is, uh, uh, is achieved by, according to Plotinus, by emanation. Right, so it's this process uh, from which every multiple reality of the universe descends from um, and um, f ultimately uh, uh, descends like from the unity of God, the absolute unity of God, right? And uh, and in this way the absolute unit of God doesn't lose anything in the process, right? So it, it, it remains this most pure transcendent element that um, is is never diminished by such derivation, and according to the image to which uh, Plotinus recurs often, the divine principle is like the uh, luminous reality, right? The 
bright reality from which light uh, spreads incessantly um, without um, without losing any um, anything of its substance, right? Without getting you know emanating, but always remain the same. Uh, and this process is known as effulguration. That is sometimes used in order to provide this idea of the emanation or as a um, uh, like uh, as an idea with greater intuitive evidence, right? This this idea that you get struck basically by th this process, this this uh, acknowledgement. Uh, so this inconditionate perfection and transcendence of the divine principle is conceived in the most rigorous way as uh, that pure Eleatic uh, entity that uh, uh, the, the character of which is of absolute unity, right? Uh, and um, that had already, uh, that was kind of old in, in Hellenic philosophy, you know, it was something that was um, uh, con put forward already by Parmenides, who was the uh, one of, was a scholar of Zeno, and excluding f from itself every uh, multiplicity, the supreme principle of the One is immune also to the primordial duality that uh, is present in the Aristotelic God, the idea of, of the thought within the thought that uh, poses um, uh, in, um, in, in comparison and identifies the uh, divi uh, divine awareness and its own content. Therefore, in order to, um, you know, in order to, to explain the character of its most elementary germination from the originary unity, uh, it has um, the, the the supreme principle has to appear um, in uh, as derived by it in, in the moment of um, in the of emanation proper. So from the transcendent and uh, in, uh, in undeniable supreme unity descends the intellect that is the nose right that is uh, doubled in the duplicity of the thinking and of, of the thought that is a concept in which flows into the Aristotelic vision of God that is remembered above and the, the platonic one of the intelligible world so this intelligible world is reflected in turn in the soul that is the third and last hypothesis in, in this emanation uh, emanative process and is an intermediate reality between mortality of the corporeal dimension and the immortality of the intelligible one uh, that is conceived by Plotinus also in the sen in the stoical sense like a uh, in informing um, universal vitality uh, that is such through the ideas that are called in in uh, in, in reference to this function the um, seminal reasons essentially so and um, and that uh, produces the material world in itself so the one the intellect and the soul um, as universal entities are three hypotheses that is um, uh, in, in, in this is the Greek name but, but in Latin is etymologically rendered as the substantia that is realities that subsist uh, in, in themselves like f ideal foundation of all the others and that in um, Plotinian Neoplatonism um, are uh, manifesting the process of descent of, of the, from the supreme principle to the limits of the sensible, uh, which is a way to reconcile in Plotinus uh, the, the the way Plotinus reconciles in his synthesis, uh, synthesis um, the most important conceptions of metaphysics and of of uh, gnosiology that had come before him. And um, aside from such hypotheses, uh, it's only matter that is indeterminate and indefinable. Uh, 
pure uh, non-being and darkness, right? Because it's basically just privation of light, it's lack of light. Um, so the concept of emanation for which the supreme principle um, albeit remaining close in its transcendent perfection multiplies its, itself giving birth to in inferior realities is presented in the Plotinian formulation like a, an original compromise between the Hellenic theology and Christian theology that, aff that, that affirms the action of God in the world operating as a creating will uh, hence the vast influence of Plotinus on the same Hellenic patristic and of, on the Christian thought in general. And in the ethical field, um, taking back the Platonic and Aristotelical, uh, Aristotelical conceptions, Pl Plotinus uh, um, states the superiority of theory over the praxis and uh, indicates into contemplation this mean of enacting um, that uh, assimilation of, of, of the divine that may uh, that that constitutes the uh, the ultimate end of the human work essentially or human activity, while the intuition of the first principle culminates into the ascetic ethics, ascetical ethics that by the progressing from the, the ethical virtues to the diano ethic ones that basically are. Uh, the 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 ones uh, founded on the discursive activity of the thought, according to the Aristotelic uh, terminologies, is enacted um, as a coming back to the one of what ha from the same one has gotten his origin, right? So, but I in other words, when when the one transcends every logical determination, his own intuition will will not uh, could not be um, a rational knowledge right it can't be um, it, because it would be uh, you know to, to which it's necessarily connected the plurality of distinction of the subject and the object but therefore this thing will could can happen only mystically speaking like a you know uh, elan of love uh, com complete dedication that uh, to which uh, the individual is able to come out of itself, right? So this is the the complexity of the thought, but at the same time, the uh, it reveals to you how how much transcendent elements of Neoplatonism could easily easily be uh, incorporated into Christian doctrines, also of the ascetics, uh, mystics, uh, and so on. And that's where we talk about Origenes, right? Uh, he was a theologian, and this was uh, a, a Christian proper. He was born uh, perhaps in Alexandria of Egypt between 183 and 185, and died uh, in Tyrus uh, in, in uh, 253 or 254. He was, as we've seen, uh, he, wa he was the uh, a student of Clements of Alexandria, that we will see later, actually, and uh, he dedicated himself uh, as a very young individual to the teaching uh, and uh, the to teaching in general. And the bishop, the matters entrusted to him, the preparation of of those who had become priests. So, and it's at this moment that uh, that originates his uh, aberration that. Uh, Therefore, there is this per periphrasis, you know, the operation of Origenes in order to, to indicate this form of self-mutilation. And, um, you know, to us, obviously, such uh, behaviors are, you know, relatively, uh, you know, incomprehensible. But, um, you know, in perspective, it, it could derive from the desire to young teacher that was also teaching in a in a female school to avoid suspects or to also to um, to maybe some some actually thought of a excessive in, uh, literal interpretation of Matthew nineteen twelve. But <coughs> excuse me, the concept is that already at the time there were certain um, environments, certain milieu in which even you know having a career uh, by 
doing something broad to the extreme for the sake of the you know of the teaching of these ideas could provide some you know some general uh, you know th there could be both of kind of ideal reasons but also concrete reasons like it's a bit like the Heunuchs in later times in the imperial uh, milieu that uh, could rise to that power because you know in order to become emperor you need a physical I integrity that these people couldn't have and therefore they were kind of favored because it was known that they couldn't and they wouldn't uh, rise to the throne and, and therefore try and a plot or something and um, whichever reason however after a uh, travel to Rome probably around 212 uh, Origenes uh, searched in uh, Alexandria for a wider philosophical education in the school of Ammonius Saccas that we mentioned before of whom uh, as we've seen also Plotinus was, was was a student right so it, it's interesting to find this parallelism also in terms of sources of, of education between these figures because that stresses the, the proximity of Neoplatonism and Christianity and um, so he um, began with the education uh, with teaching to the beginners at in at Heracla um, and uh, he eventually um, reorganized the uh, Didascaleion in Alexandria and the bishop Demetrius man uh, I mean tried at least uh, in, in on several occasions to disciplinate the activity of the Didascaleion and um, and of his young master that had acquired by this time already great uh, great fame so um the um um uh, uh, originus was sent in 250 in palestine to preach that although he was still a layman actually uh, to the baptized right which was a practice that was actually forbidden in the uh, in the alexandrine practice so at this point originus received um actually later on, on around 230 uh, tr uh, during another travel to Syria and in Asia Minor uh, the sacerdotal um, order right and ordination and by uh, two uh, bishops that were friends of his they were Alexander of Jerusalem and Theoctistus of Caesarea and uh, the matters was actually pretty uh, uh, you know, angry about this, and he deposed Origenes. So Origenes went then to Caesarea of Palestine and found in here a school that continued eventually his own work and through which his own influx would remain for uh, predominant for great part of the third and also a good part of the fourth century. So actually, he would have an enormous success. Um, in 250, tw uh, between 250 and 53, Origenes was hit by Dash's persecution mm -hmm. and he died after the tortures that he suffered. Um, and he left this enormous uh, written production. Um, as Eusebius claimed, um, as St. Jerolimus somewhat confirmed, that uh, he that Origenes had written more than one hundred uh, one thousand works. So this is mostly biblical exegesis, commentaries, theological uh, texts, and uh, uh, other also pamphlets and, and letters. But unfortunately, all of this production went by by large lost. Right. In Greek, we have the comments to John and Matthew, um, a series of homilies and the uh, work against the uh, pagan philosopher Celsus, who's very famous, and um, other two works uh, that the it's the um, the exhortation to martyrdom and on prayer, right? 
On the Latin, in the Latin version of Rufinus, together with several uh, homilies, there is this um, major work that uh, is, uh, despite being from his youth, from 212, 215, about uh, circa, and which is the De Principis, right? So the on, on the principles that um, that are um, you know. Uh, also used in, in a fragmentary form by in in the work of Saint uh, Jerome that has his own version. But these versions were born in in a in an environment and in circumstances of very uh, you know strong po polemics, right? And, and this presented uh, certain passes. And interpretations that are rather dubious and that present serious problems of authenticity. Nevertheless, Origenes represents the, f the true concrete effort to organize a sound philosophical and theological thought starting from the Bible and from the ecclesiastical tradition. So the catechistic work of Origenes was uninterruptedly carried out and it's uh, witnessed by his homilies. In fact, um, the, uh, the, the scriptural exegesis on which he spent also an enormous amount of his work, especially in the comments, makes of, um, of Origenes, especially, first of all, a great Biblist, right? He uh, didn't just want to found a critical textual revision of the Bible, but he also wanted to give of it an interpretation that beyond the literal uh, meaning could uh, understand this sense of spiritual truth, right? So th that this is the immense exegetic effort of Origenes uh, that in the Old Testament finds the symbols and the prefigurations of the economy of the Old Testament that is founded on Christ and on the Church. So, Origenes in the uh, Holy Scriptures distinguishes a double direction. There, there, there is the literal one, to which the, sim the, the simple believers stop themselves to, right, uh, limit themselves to. And then there is the spiritual or mystical one, um, to which can access the perfects. Does the, to remember something? You know, it is very exoteric, very Neoplatonic in in character, um, if you want. And um, so the perfects are those who can uh, catch the spiritual meaning of the letter, right? From from the scripture moves uh, all the speculation that Origenes um, uh, wants to to find uh, a. Uh, through allegorical exegesis uh, as a as a base as a founding, right? You know, and and it's it's interesting because um, sometimes he even goes astray from that, meaning that he also uses so many other philosophical elements that sometimes you even wonder who's talking about the Bible. But that's the point. It, it's it's really searching beyond. Right, all the knowledge that can be interpreted. So it's important because you realize the Christian culture, in this sense, uh, developed from a largely pagan past, and that used actually pagan knowledge uh, immensely because it it reputed it worthy of of this knowledge, and that that um, um, you know it, it recognized the knowledge in itself and as a uh, you, you have to think these were people living within the empire and right? living within a world that was like that since centuries and that had produced this um, immense amount of wealth. And even if the re Christian religion was now two centuries old, um, still uh, this broader Hellenistic um, world of philosophies and different thoughts, etc., is... Um, is what was the natural environment f from which not just Christianity but even Judaism had originated from, uh, had dwelt from? It maybe not originated in the case of Judaism, absolutely not, but you know that had become at the time of the birth of Christianity. Like you know, Judaism was largely Hellenized at that point, 
and the hand in fact uh, uh, you know absorbed this also uh, philosophical uh, skills uh, at the end of the day so um, there is um, much to to, un to understand uh, in this sense um, the, the um, Origenes speculative masterpiece is the De Principis that we that we mentioned before and this is a uh, work made by four books that are respectively God and the celestial beings the material world and, and, and man the free will the holy scripture so this wants to be a deepening of the revealed and transmitted data um, um, uh, of uh, within the the, uh, the ecclesiastical tradition right in, in this deepening uh, uh, origin is uh, develops all its um, you know applies act applicates all its wide culture um, uh, its philosophical culture mostly that shows its familiarity especially with the Platonic and Neoplatonic writers, but also with the Stoics and the Gnostics, etc. So you can see here the pool of 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 schools of um, of currents of uh, ideas of, of and of other theological system at the end of the day. <coughs> so with which originists knew how to confront Um So originists has an extremely rigid conception of the fullest and absolute transcendence of God, right? That he calls the monad. So the personal God, the utmost good, um, despite being a creator, cannot come into contact with the with evil and matter. Right? This is this is very strong. You know, this is a platonic concept as you understand. So God has directly created the spiritual substances that were initially incorporeous, uh, incorporeal and uh, given of free will, but that eventually had decayed, right, and uh, had redressed in their body with a less uh, uh, bright and or uh, opaque in in more or less you know either luminous or opaque in in reason of their um, lesser or or greater gravity in the insane right so only um let's say in here the, the hierarchy of beings that is of of clearly platonic character as a concept is um follows is developed in this fashion from angels to men to uh, to animals to to um the plants to the demons right so this is interesting because y you understand that even the creation has a kind of a uh, better or worse character in, ser in terms of sin and, and mankind actually is um, is in between even the uh, this other natural and um, and divine dimension right w which kind of makes sense and but the demons are beyond even the material side, so that um, the demons assume the the most ne negative character. Uh, at this point, you would think as uh, kind of fully, uh, not even bestial, but devoid of uh, of spirit beings, right? Which is also, in fact, a Neoplatonic concept. So mankind is composed by men. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> mankind is composed by soul and body. Uh, it's a perfectly free being and can opt between good and evil. And the universe that is put in motion by a initial sin is started, uh, is launched towards the definitive reintegration because at one point God will be everything in everybody, like in a pantheism. So it will be contemplated and known directly one point we think about the second come of Christ so um, at, at, at that point it's will be denied the eternity of the uh, actually well it originates 
it's denied the eternity of the um, punishments but not the resurrection right uh, Origenes admits in every rational nature the capacity to camp to come back step by step up to the incor the definitive incorpority and the enlightenment of the minds is a work of Jesus in which coexist the divine nature of the logos and the human one and the logos that is the place of the ideas of the eternal prototypes of reality is for origin uh, for origin is eternal it's God right but it is in, in this sense a autotheos that is in fact the, the only one who has this uh, automatic function right so he the, the one from which everything uh, uh, descends from so uh, incarnated in Jesus Christ the Logos leads the reasonable being to the contemplation and to the superior knowledge or gnosis right that allows the full comprehension of the true meaning of scriptures right so this is essentially origin's idea. So um, this great uh, figures are definitely uh, having a, a, an immense impact in later uh, f philosophies, um, a bit throughout all the the area, historically speaking, not just within the empire but also beyond. Right. So this. N idea of gnosis, think about for example even Mazdaism, all the impact this would have, th think about figures like Basilides, Valentinus, Martian, uh, all these Gnostic elements that you find both in the Byzantine and the Sasanian Empire, it's their continuation uh, in the Manichaeans, in Bogomils, even in the Kathars and in certain uh, Islamic heretical currents in the Middle Ages. I mean it all starts from these ideas that of course uh, are not the only source of them that as we've just seen it was uh, full of them all around but that these odors help to catalyze in, um, in in a form that gives them a kind of a more, more doctrinary uh, uh, you know systematization and that therefore make them easier to, to, to identify and to, 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 to embrace as entire, entire structures that uh, appear, appear as exoteric and that uh, that are fascinating in, in, in the in on the base in fact of their complexity on the fact that requires studying and this this seducing element of the story that is based on intellectualism I mean the idea you can find this trick in order to uh, to to solve life to solve your the problem of salvation and all this stuff right and everybody obviously but think about Saint Augustine that was still in, it was first a Manichaean then eventually a Christian, um, and how you know these things were debated on and on. And d definitely, Origenes maintained this this Christian character, but the idea is that there is a kind of a uh, wider perception at this point, and the boundaries of the same Christianity are still very loose, right? Uh, there is definitely a tradition. There is a consistent uh, uh, community that. That at this point remains uh, interestingly enough uh, orthodox you know it, it kind of maintains with this traditional I mean it's early maybe you're talking about orthodoxy but dr there is a, a f um, you know a branch of tradition that is the majority one that remains and would become effectively the orthodox one with Nicaea eventually uh, but th there are all these other branches that ran uh, close so it's the, uh, the living parallel in, in this great Hellenistic world, in which the that the, the Hellenistic the, the the Roman Empire also favored because of this tolerance and its um, uh, at this point, of course, the, 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 the you know tolerance is relative, of course, because you know the, the, the empire was not tolerant in the way we, we mean it modernly speaking. It simply meant you know as long as it was wasn't someone was bothering in some way everything was accepted but there were certain cults and superstitions that were persecuted saying Christians were persecuted at this time because they refused to to accept in fact this um, polytheistic dimension I mean the idea that <coughs> excuse me that there had to be more than one God they had to uh, to uh, to sacrifice to essentially so the uh, rather than did their one so obviously many Christians did as if that was not a problem I mean, there were even certain Christian 
uh, I mean, orthodox thinkers said, okay, you know, if you really have to die in order to 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 commit uh, not to avoid the, the sacrifice to an imperial deity, well, you can't do it. It's still a sin, but it's not a huge deal. You know, you can make up for that. So. Um, there are interesting perspectives in this sense we're not going to discuss because we we discussed it in other in other on other occasions too but it's still important to bear in mind um so uh, what is very important in um in this sense is that the the great what well, you know the, the this last great movement intellectual movement in the east is the appearance of uh, a very important christian literature in greek language at this point and this literature as we know existed since the, the last uh, years of the first century because you know that's effectively what the bible was already written in like and um but it flourished it had flourished actually already especially under the uh, the reign of the Antonines and under the, the the Severians, right, with four others that now we see. So the first one is uh, Irenaeus of of Lyon, right. So uh, he was originally perhaps of Smyrna, where uh, still young, uh, he had uh, following Saint Polycarpus during the persecution of Marcus Aurelius. He was already in Gaul, right. He was priest in the Church of Lyon as um, as such, in 177, 178, was sent to Rome uh, with a letter on Montanism that was another uh, uh, movement, uh, a radical movement, movements uh, uh, of the f faithful uh, of the believers of Lyon, where um, after a while uh, succeeded himself to the bishop and martyr Photinus. And in one of his letters um, to the Pope Victor, uh, with whom he tries to pacify basically the, the, the same Pope and the churches of Asia for in, in the matters for of Easter that now we don't have time to explain, is also preserved by Eusebius. But the greatest work of Irenaeus is the uh, adversus heresis, at least this is the Latin term, it is often uh, quoted like this, the, the title is actually in Greek, and um, about which are we have uh, one Latin version that is mm, prior to St. Augustine and certain Greek fram fragments. Um, and in this work, um, basically Irenaeus criticizes all the various Gnostic systems, and this is interesting because you see, you know, what Christianity event, you know, uh, we have seen that the, the, even pagan authors used to do this on a daily basis. I mean, they were philosophers of a certain school, and they they criticized the other systems by saying, you know, basically, you know, we, we are right, you're wrong, and here I explain you why. So the Christians start exactly in the same way because the the literary um, skills that I acquire are substantially based on the same uh, pagan ones because that's that was the civilization at the time and it's interesting that even before uh, this uh, you know the legalization of Christianity Christians had acquired on some occasions despite uh, being relatively emarginated such uh, such skills grammatically rhetorically dialectically etc so, um, and and this is very interesting because eventually, uh, many of these um, theories of the um, pagan uh, systems that were criticized by the Christians were, you know, were taken out were, um, with the spread of Christianity. Um, and and therefore, I it's the same Christian works that allow us. Because they are Christian to know something about those systems, because uh, since they were written by a Christian to criticize the, the, the pagans, you know, that ironically made those same pagan thoughts, albeit reflexed and sometimes even distorted, uh, surviving uh, historically, right? Um, the uh, 
This is interesting because Irenaeus, uh, as a historical source, um, was originally a bit uh, distrusted, but now it's been rehabilitated, uh, also because of uh, certain finds uh, other, of other texts that, um, however, you know, are mostly about the systems of his own contemporaries, so that there is this um, comparison that allowed, however, to, to understand that Irenaeus was was within a system that, uh, with with many, you know, he was falling into a, a real system, he wasn't really criticizing just without um, cognition, right? So Irenaeus was a defensor of the theology of Logos that, uh, and had this great vision of the history of humanity and of the material world that were recapitulated in Christ. And he was also marked, characterized by this uh, most uh, strong sense of the church. Um, he uh, the, he, the thing about these controversies that uh, were, you know, rising on the base of certain texts relatively to the principality of the church, for example, the saints Peter and Paul, and um, and what this, you know, he he wrote actually a lot of material himself that was criticized later, and he was also millinerist, and um, of all this we have. Uh, however, a few scarce traces in the uh, in the demonstration of the apostolic pre uh, preaching that has been relatively found relatively recently from an uh, an Armenian version, and uh, and it's important. He's a saint, as you know, uh, of the uh, of the church. Still, the other one is another saint, Hippolytus of Rome. Uh, was a theologian, priest, and uh, even anti-pope in Rome. It was martyrized in 235 or 236. And the only sh sure uh, informations that we have about him are given by the so-called philosophomena. Uh, um, in the, um, that was uh, already known and attributed to Origenes uh, initially, um, and and there is a uh, you know maybe it's co complicated here the philological composition of his work and we know that uh, looking at okay well he was martyr yeah he did, he had a pretty troubled life at one point um, but in talking about him you know. Uh, we know about his legion as a martyr, etc., um, and that somewhat also obscured his own uh, his own figure. And um, he was a follower of uh, Irenaeus himself. Uh, he was against uh, Noetus uh, Patripassian monarchianism. Um, he maintained the, the theology of Logos, however, swinging between the doctrine of the uh, Greek apologists uh, with his own tendencies towards the subordinationism and economical conception of Trinity that kind of uh, puts him closer to Tertullian that now we will see. Uh, Tertullianus. Uh, yes. And... Um, and, and there is this aversion towards the Roman Empire, you know, and, and pagan philosophy into which uh, same Hippolytus um, saw the root of all the heresies that he analyzes in his Philosophumen would culminate in the accusations against Callistus, who was the Pope uh, that Hippolytus was anti-Pope to, um, and of which he actually gives a... Uh, tendentious, let's say, biography, and fights the uh, disciplinary and penitential uh, orders that in, in the name of, of a more rigoristic conception of the Church, according to which um, it would be 
basically just a community only of saints, right? So, and and there are this also uh, strong eschatological hopes. Um, the most vivacious ones are in the uh, in the small treaty uh, on the Antichrist, and that are a bit attenuated later on progressively uh, in the comment to Daniel and in the chapters against Caius. Caius was a Roman priest that uh, by adversion of Montanism wanted to basically uh, take out uh, you know from the biblical canon the, the, the apocalypse right so and uh, this is the you know kind of still the moment in which there was such uh, an active debate it was actually increasing right in the ch within the church and creating trouble eventually opened after the legalization of Christianity to the necessity of sticking to, to doctrine at one point um, so these are uh, milieus that are starting to to become more dynamic from an intellectual point of view right and they, they create problems consequently um, and there is also an attenuation of millenarism in Hippolytus at one point and also the abandonment of the economic theology and Hippolytus um, um, is um, some people that this change occurred because he seemingly came closer to the imperial court that at this point also was in contact with Christians, especially with Julia Mammea, to whom uh, he dedicated um, a, uh, a text on resurrection, right? And Hippolytus um, and Calixtus would be, by the way, certain important representatives of the, uh, respectively, of the Greek and of the Latin element that was uh, at this point prevalent in the Roman community uh, of the Christians um, and and this explains why in, in aside from the schism why for example so the, there is a greater spread of Hippolytus works uh, in, in in the East interestingly enough this other figure is Clemens Alexandrinus uh, Titus Flavius Clemens that uh, was born perhaps in Athens between 145 150 um, and died perhaps at Caesarea in Cappadocia between 211 and 217 um, uh, this figure traveled in his youth and event eventually settled in, in Alexandria where uh, since 190 became a presbyter and during the persecution of Septimius Severus uh, we're talking about Christians here uh, in 202 he uh, take refuge. He took refuge to the disciple Alexander, who was bishop of Caesarea, and it was a, a almost certainly a, a converse. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't born Christian, right? He converted at one point, and he um, f uh, was educated in the Alexandrian milieu. Uh, the contact with uh, Greco Hellenistic culture, and especially with the obviously a Judeo-Christian group and this cultural experience uh, conditioned two fundamental traits of his uh, personality because there is this wide use of his of um, uh, Hellenic philosophy and especially of its um, Platonic Stoic tendencies of the Hellenistic age and in the elaboration of a Christian Gnosis that together with the allegorism and the interpretation of the sacred text um, uh, it, um, it it becomes especially this last one actually becomes a, a need all in function of the first uh, and that makes him closer to Philo and to the Judeo-Hellenists so this influences explain however how the reaction of Clemens to Gnosticism that refused the the old the the old law and especially of the um, Gnostic mythology so Clement's Gnosis that uh, is opposed to contemporary Gnosticism is a form of religious knowledge um, according to the this exception assumed from the term uh, by the term in in, philo uh, in the Hellenistic religious philosophy that uses all the Greek cultural tradition was considered participating 
as well to the log to the divine logos because um, it, it it reached certain truths. So this there is this ability of um, accepting part of the pagan world had been right, right? Because they 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 assumed that certain forms of knowledge uh, were of truth would were already accepted. This is interesting because it opens a, a particular relation with the concept of revelation, right? And blended this Greek cultural tradition itself with the teachings of the Judeo-Christian revelation, in fact. So, uh, it, this becomes in a perspective in which revelation itself is essential to the Gnosis, and philosophy and religion um, are to be identified like a sort of approaching and of imitation of God, right? So, the uh, Clement's works are the uh, the Protrepticus to the Greeks uh, that criticizes the religion and mythology of the pagans with certain arguments of Stoic intonation and of uh, Judaic origin. Uh, the Pedagogue, in which um, he um, deals with the uh, the true problem of the uh, Christian education that he unites with uh, revelation and cultural philosophy. Uh, and that of, of which that that he uses in order to reach the gnosis, right? So the ethical dominant mo motives are, are taken back f taken from the Stoa through Musonius Rufus especially. Then there are the Stromata, that is a miscellaneous uh, collection that contains some of the most interesting elements, both for the posit positive valuation of of actual Hellenic culture that is considered a sort of testament given to the Gentiles and in parallel to the testament given to the Jews. And um, and also uh, uh, this uh, wide exposition of the Gnostic ideal uh, of, of Christian life. And this and to this superior's knowledge the minds that are formed uh, into culture and philosophy can 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 reach right so there are also the extracts from Theodotus that are fragments that are of the Gnostic scripts of Theodotus that were collected uh, by uh, Clements at the end of uh, you know with the aim of confuting them substantially the last order is Tertullian right or Tertullianus actually uh, Quintus Septimius Florence, right, um, uh, was an apologite uh, and uh, and writer of Christian religion. He was um, born in Carthage between 155 and 160 and died at 230. And he received a complete classical education that comprised also a good knowledge of Greek, right? He wasn't. Greek by language, and it's important because he represents this Latin element that is rising in the West, not surprisingly, um, within this literary background that, as we've seen, was dominated by Greek and will, as you know, as we will see, will, will increase in the West, right? Uh, as a, a Latin, uh, as a Latin production. So Tertullian actually started by studying law, and he became quite expert into it. In fact, um, some some people even identified him with the homonymous jurists, jurist that uh, that some uh, that that is uh, referred to in the digestum of of Justinian. And um, Tertullian was probably also in Rome, but we don't know when and and how many times. And he he was also converted. He converted to Christianity uh, uh, relatively late. I mean, in around 190, 195. But that happened rapidly and definitively. So uh, from that on, moment on, Tertullian was this the hardest and most combative uh, fighter for the new faith to the advantage of which he employed all of the resources of his vast culture and in his own dialectic. As we know, he was, as we know, it's very, very important 
in law at that time because it was based on this public speeches etc dialectic was everything in there convincing and this was put at the service of mm, polemical aims um, and he was a very vigorous but uh, criti uh, you know he criticized very vigorously but not very rigorously sometimes and he was very severe you know he was very stern in many ways in his, in his ethical religious conception and he had this very tenacious eschatological worries that brought him around 207 uh, to approach Montanism uh, to which he eventually adhered to right and in this he was coherent because his Christianism had always brought this print of a um, neatly realistic spirit and of a firm faith in the original eschatological values and Tertullian lived rather a long time as we've seen and uh, but we don't really know um, where and when he died and with Tertullian um, the Christianity of Western Roman Africa had that would have this decisive part in the history of Christianity of the Empire think about St. Augustine in fact uh, entered in the first light of history right this is a province that will rise at that point as basically the most advanced um, cultural center in the west of the empire and um, with Tertullian in fact we uh, start the uh, uh, generally uh, I mean from a deduct deductive point of view the Western Latin theology right that was slowly by uh, you know di differentiating from the great um, uh, Greek uh, Oriental theological speculation and Tertullian gave to this theology the uh, print of his faith uh, was dominated by the matters of uh, of the community and by e and of ethical problems so um, there, there is uh, this re remarkable contribution of Tertullian to the Trinitary problem that he resolved in an anti-monarchian sense with a conception of the divine unity as a multiplicity of, of hypotheses each in correspondence of a given moment um, uh, of the evolution or uh, let's say of the uh, religious evolution of humanity uh, Tertullian used, uh, by the way, um, uh, for the first time, therefore laying the fundamentals of uh, the Latin theological terminology, the concepts of Trinitas, Substantia, and Persona, right? So the Trinity, the Substance, and, and the Persona. And, um, and against Martian and the Gnostics, he defended strongly the idea of the unity of God, and of his revelation in the scriptures included the Old Testament right um, as you know um, Martian was very critical of, of the Old Testament um, so Tertullian defends it and um, against the Gnostics in particular Tertullian refused the idea of the safety as a personal experience of the believer in the teaching of Christ uh, restating energetically the redemption true incarnation and death of re resurrection of Jesus there was a prelude to the resurrection uh, of, of the dead and the restoration the instauration of the kingdom so Tertullian's contribution to the definition of the dogma is also permeated by a strong realism that is contrary to every uh, version purely uh, sp uh, purely speculative version I'd say of the uh, religious and theological values and in the consideration of the problems and of the soul and of God uh, Tertullian brought uh, this this anxiety of his of uh, about the concrete element by speaking about the corporeity of the soul and of corporate of sui generis corporeity of God and um, uh, he, uh, Tertullian's apologetics was very bitter and robust he claimed against the imperial persecution the, the same uh, fundament of the Roman law this is very important because he saw uh, this ability uh, I mean this this um, 
existence within Roman law of the same um, uh, f freedom of belief, of, of justice and equity that were violated by the pagan judges that were, um, uh, uh, you know, prejudiced, essentially impartial with the Christians. So Tertullian's attitude towards persecution is not just of defense and of criticism, but especially of challenge. I mean, in front of this battle, he doesn't give up, and he not, nor he searches for a settlement, but he claims this full right to the life of the new faith, and he feels like um, the recapitulation of this, the, the pre-Christian spirituality that is fully legitimated in front of philosophy, of reason, of morality, and of the same positive right. And um, we have trouble at uh, dating uh, 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 the chronology, uh, say dating uh, Tertullian's uh, works. Uh, the first one are uh, Ad Naciones and the Apologeticum. Um, a group of, tr of moral treatises that deal with the problems of Christian community um, and that, that goes for very long. There, there is also another work known as Ad Martires and um, this go from uh, roughly from 200 and 212, the series of works and, and, and these are the, the, the baptismal uh, the baptism also on the uh, at the Orazione, de Pazienza, de Penitencia, de Idolatria, de Virginibus Velandis, de Cultu Feminarum, and are works of theological polemics, anti heretical polemics, such as the De Prescriptione Hereticorum, the Adversus Hermogenem, the Adversus Valentinianus, the Adversus Marcionem, the De Carne Christi. The, the De Resurrezione Carnis. Uh, these are about 200, 211 circa. And from the mountainous period uh, belong, uh, and that it is of the last years, like 212, 222, uh, other works like uh, the De Fuga in Persecuzione, Ad Versus Praxean, De Monogamia, De Jejunio, uh, De Pudicizia and other, others like Adversus Judeus, uh, De Pallio, De Exhortatione Castitatis, De Corona Militis, Scorpiace, Ad Scapulum. Some had attributed to him the um, Passio uh, Sanctissime Perpetue et Felicitatis that however are not by him really. And uh, he was actually a talented writer. Tertullian was the true creator of ecclesiastical Latin, one of the greatest writers of Latin literature, into which his own work represents a, a decisive, um, you know, change. And this is important because you realize that Latin here is a uh, he he was a jurist, he was a lawyer, so he definitely knew how to use Latin at that point in a very clever way, in a very combat, you know combative way, so um, it could really uh, put the service of Christianity now the skills that would be read by others and uh, uh, basically bring uh, this uh, emulation, right? And um, also in style and practices. So looking at this world, um, um, you know, this literary production is very important because you you s uh, you realize that uh, at the end of the Severian dynasty uh, you you can't find so many changes at this point occurred uh, from one side so certain elements that had constituted go imperial governments in past centuries um, and others that had changed but if you look in perspective the the empire had evolved with some kind of extraordinary elasticity. Um, this literary production uh, highlights the ability of the empire to still absorb new cultures and new ideas and new systems. Uh, the empire didn't sclerotize at this point. It was still alive. It was still full of uh, stimuli and of uh, other um, intuitions, let's say, and uh, 
you can't criticize how much this change actually corresponds to a real reflourishing of of a dynamic of course society was changing it was it wasn't like the, the freer one before certain things were certain changes were actually brutal right um, but um, the empire had adapted to this and and uh, this uh, uh, this is a, a proof of strength so that even this idea of the decline is actually showing that the empire had uh, accomplished a lot even the crisis of the third century is solved the empire could end at one point, but it didn't, right? And in there, obviously, different elements changed. Maybe it wasn't the, the philosophers who saved the empire, because it wasn't. Uh, it was the military at that point, so that had a very different culture, would reinforce different models, would uh, reformulate them. So looking at the Severian Age, it's, it's looking at a moment of, like, the relative calm before the tempest that, that would change the, the empire forever, would would shift it uh, internally on, on different bases, and so it it would. Uh, this age is very fascinating because we have looked at this authors and we've seen how actually close they were sometimes. You know, especially those born in the mid seventh second century. You know, how close they were to I don't know, Hadrian or, or to Trajan. You know, to a world that. Uh, wasn't maybe that different even before, but that uh, still tastes this as, in, in our modern perspective, as ah, the, the glory of the early empire. And yet, if we find at the beginning of the third century that already this transition towards uh, different cultural models, etc., appears. It's strange because we say, uh, we, when we think about the, the changes of Christianization, of the dominate, and everything, we say, ah, the, the fourth century. You know, certain thoughts, certain um, ideas, certain ways of looking at this world had started being experimented very early in time and by people who had lived, in fact, at the acme of the empire. Most of these odors had lived uh, through, you know, the the, uh, the the Antonine times, right? There had been the best times for being a Roman in absolute terms. Uh, in terms of quality of life and everything, and this is probably what also brought to all of this circulation of ideas, of experimentation, of blendings, and so on. So many people see this period as a decadent moment because of you know all of this, um, you know, emperors that you know were sometimes pretty weird, that kill each other, <laughs> brothers. Some were kind of a um, you know that they ruled the empire like like a matriarchy that was absolutely opposite to the imperial idea, etc. But there is, uh, and much has been written about this, but at the same time, looking at the essentials of the, of the empire, after all, we, we can't really say that things started going wrong exactly because of this ferments, you know, that actually prove that there was some vivacity, that people could, could, could enjoy this world, could make it work, right? And it probably, you know, uh, there had been, if you, know, if you look at it in perspective, this is the uh, these are the years of the Constitution Toniniana, so the moment in which uh, every uh, s subject of the empire was was a Roman citizen, right? Rome had a right to the point in which it had managed to 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 uh, aggregate the elites of the provinces to uh, its own senators and its own. Uh, knights and to maintain the prestige of a political body without power was the Senate. It had managed to absorb the homicides of the governance and uh, two civil wars during this time and to extend Roman citizenship, in fact, to all of these uh, free men without suppress their uh, <laughs> excuse me uh, link with the small uh, the small uh, this idea that, that you can't carve basically your own Roman um, world wherever you are in Rome, that you're all that you're a part of this world. That 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 is a concept that gives confidence and security, and of a certain prosperity as well. So naturally, this system has showed certain weaknesses that cannot be ignored. Probably worked badly, uh, possibly worked badly. You know, so. Depends 
you know, what is the state that actually works well, especially in these dimensions, right? Governing the empire was not easy, and there weren't many means of control. Um, but it had functioned, in spite of all, exactly because of these characteristics, of having managed to expand so much of humanity and having, having, you know, received a positive answer from the other side. When th there are the, the, the there is the African revolt against Maximin the, tr the tracks. Um, you find in this modest tomb of an African killed in 238 in this uh, uh, against Ma uh, Maximin that was judged as barbaric and tyrannic. Uh, this this phrase is, is he died for the love of Rome, like th this provincial that now he was, uh, you know, that had died because he had loved the empire in in its uh, in its in these dynamics. In in fact, that Rome had managed to extend this greatness to all the provinces. To all, everybody could be a Roman now. Everybody could enjoy its part of Rome, and and, and having its rights and, and so on. So. This is now I w the video is very long. I will not continue, and this is just f food for thought in general. But there is a, an immensely powerful uh, comment we could make on this, maybe in some other video about all the implications of this and how this had happened and the success of Rome and Romanization, etc. And uh, these are important aspects, and they cannot be dismissed. They cannot be ignored, and they have to do with the uh, ability of Rome, like no other empire, objectively this time, of extending a, a right of freedom. Let's be honest about this. Uh, this is not, aside from the fact you say, well, there was slavery. Yes, of course, there was slavery. Uh, the problem with Rome, actually, at this point, is that slavery would partly, uh, you know, decrease at the point that uh, d that it would create economical problems. But because the wars of expansions had finished the crisis in the third century, mostly because of defensive reasons, etc. Uh, I mean, when it comes to to uh, the the absence, in fact, of great uh, of wars of conquest that could bring in other slaves, probably the uh, this thing has been maybe not overly exaggerated because it it definitely worked that way. But at the same time, this system adapts progressively to it. Um, but it, it's the idea that you can be a Roman citizen, that is, that you are a freeman with rights. This is not a few, like, uh, no other empire ever did anything like this, right? It is true that from this time onwards, what the Roman Empire starts looking more like, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, there is this transition between citizens to subjects, but this is also something that will take a lot of time. And it takes also the crisis of the of the third century to to dig this this um, this change and and this this division between the you know the, the elite and the masses. There is something is appearing already at this point, but um, it's not so evident as one may think. And it's complicated to talk about these topics now. We we can't. It, it eludes our 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 point today, but definitely we will talk more about the Severian Age. Definitely, for now, we've stopped to this uh, just literary survey, um, and uh, uh, we'll talk about these things on another occasion. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents, and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.